Par contre, right now, we're going to segue on the main stage to a very interesting presentation on a company called Prezi that helps you make presentations. I'm a big fan of Prezi, and we have none other than the Director of Global Communication and Head of Remote at Prezi, Spencer Walden. I'm going to pass it off to Spencer and Galit. So all of us have this voice in the back of our minds that warns us to be safe, to be cautious, to not take any risks. Don't do this, don't do that. And definitely think twice about speaking up in a meeting or standing up and giving a presentation. And it's this voice that I want to talk about, about how we can drown it out a little bit so we can all have more confidence when it comes to speaking up in virtual meetings and giving presentations. Now, 25 years ago, I came across a piece of text that now, when I look back, completely changed how I think about many things in life, but also confidence. It was written in 1927, and it's completely relevant to today as well. But there's two things I want to highlight that are relevant to confidence. So the first is this, if you compare yourself with other people, you will only become vain or bitter because always there are greater and lesser persons than yourself. And this is so true if you think about the 15 minutes before you give a talk or the 15 minutes before you speak up in a meeting. If you start thinking about how experienced everybody else is in the room or other people are better speakers or who am I to speak up, then what that does is that's that voice eroding away at our confidence trying to keep us safe. And the second thing I want to pull out of this is this line here that says, but do not distress yourself with imaginings, for many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. And it's also very true. It's good life advice. Never make a decision when you're tired or lonely or vulnerable. But the reason that it says do not distress yourself with imaginings is because when you're tired, when you're lonely, when you're vulnerable, that voice, that biological voice that we have trying to keep us safe is even louder. So let's keep those two things in the back of our minds as we explore a bit how we can all be more confident in a meeting. So I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes I sit in a meeting and this is what it looks like. Everybody's talking with confidence, saying really great things and I have something I want to say but I don't quite know when I can jump in and I don't want to interrupt and you know somebody's talking with a lot more confidence than I have and are more eloquent and in the end I don't actually say anything it's like the bystander effect it misses passes me by now we're all the same in this regard because we all have the same biology our brain for millennia has been trying to keep us safe. And thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, that was pretty useful. But today, it's less. And the brain has these things happening all the time. It's almost like three filters that our brain understands what's going on in the outside world. And risk avoidance is probably the most powerful thing that's happening at an unconscious level. And it's that risk avoidance that creates that little voice, that feeling of maybe I shouldn't do that, maybe I should stay safe. And it's something that we all have. It doesn't matter what level of experience you have. You know, I've been talking from stages and creating video content for years now, and yet I still suffer from imposter syndrome and the bystander effect. I still have those moments before I speak where that little inner voice is saying, really Spencer? Who are you to speak up and say what you're going to say? So it's completely natural. And this gives us almost like a bit of freedom because we're all the same. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO of a company or you're the most junior person. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert. We're all the same. 
So then what you start to understand is that some people have just managed to find a way to deal with it better. So therefore confidence is a skill. And if it's a skill, then it's like a muscle that we can train and make stronger and better. So let's look at three ways that we can train our confidence muscle and override that little voice. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is positive self-talk, because for me, this is the most important and the most powerful. And it starts with finding our motto, those words that we see or say every day that guide us. Now, my motto, I found quite by accident. This is a photo of me from 1999. And I was on a backpacking year out that turned into two years of traveling. And when I think back, that photograph for you won't say that much. But for me, I remember sitting on those stairs and for the first time feeling confident about traveling and being in a different place and being far from home and all those kind of things. And when I think back to the the young Spencer that got on that plane in Manchester to fly to India with not really any plan, a bit of money in my pocket and a bag on my back, I was petrified. I didn't sleep for the two or three nights before I left. But what I discovered in that trip that became true all the way through my life is that it's always more scary to think about doing something than to actually do it. And this kind of became my unofficial motto that it's harder to think about something before. And why? Because when I look back now, you know, the Spencer back then didn't understand so much about the brain and how decisions are happening. And, and now I understand that that's that voice. It's that biological brain unconsciously trying to keep us safe. Why on earth would you put yourself at risk and go do something like this? It's better to stay where you are. So we need to think about how can we get rid of that voice? Because we all have this inner voice, this inner demon. You know, when we're in a meeting, when I'm in a meeting and I'm thinking, OK, I need to speak up. I need to say this idea or I need to talk about something. And my inner, inner voice is saying, yeah, but Spencer, don't talk now. Look, Sarah's talking and she's like, look, everybody's hanging off every word that she's saying and she's more experienced than you. So if you talk now, maybe it's not going to sound very good. So I don't. And then somebody else jumps in and starts to take the discussion maybe to a slightly different angle. And I'm like, oh, I need to talk now because otherwise it's going to be too late. But my voice is in a, in a demon. He's saying, yeah, but Spencer, don't talk now because it's going to seem a bit weird. Like it's the conversation is going to a different angle. So we need to know how do we stop that voice? Because that's what we need to override. And remember, it's just biology that we've had for millennia that we need to try and get around. Now, I found a way that worked for me and I think it can help you as well. And it started years ago when I first started talking from stages. So this is the first time I ever spoke in front of 200 people at a conference. Now, 10 minutes before that conference started, I was literally behind this stage with my inner demon. And my inner demon was saying, are you completely insane, Spencer? You work for a presentation company and the first time you're gonna give a talk is a talk about presentations. Are you completely mad? And I felt so terrible. I was literally either wanting to vomit in a bin somewhere or to run away. And I think the only reason I didn't walk away is because I had no choice at that point. And of course, true to my motto, it was the hardest part of that experience was the 10 minutes before I went on stage. I got on stage, I did an okay job. For sure, it wasn't the best presentation I've ever done. I've learned many things in the last five or six years. But what I started to understand is emotions are what's responsible because I, I discovered in subsequent years that emotions and feelings are two different things. So we have a conscious and an unconscious part of our brain. Our conscious part of the brain is the brain that you're using right now watching this video, thinking, who is this person? Should I believe him? Should I listen to him? What proof do I have? It's that rational thinking brain that we have. But our emotions sit in our unconscious ancient brain structures, places like the amygdala and the cerebellum. And an emotion is a physical set of 
instructions almost that our body carries out. And there are only six of them. And if we take fear, because that's what we're talking about now, that feeling you have before you stand up and talk in front of people, what's the physical things you get when you're scared? Your heart beats faster, sweaty palms, adrenaline in the blood system. That's an emotion. Our modern brain, our cerebral cortex, interprets what's happening at a physical level and decides, quick, let's run away. This is scary. We don't want to do it. Stay safe. Now, what you understand is feelings, which we have in our modern conscious cerebral cortex brain. There are many, many feelings that can be interpreted from the same set or similar set of physical manifestations in our body. And this is where we start to understand how we can override that voice that tells us to be cautious. Because if we go into fear, we see that excitement is the same as fear. Because what happens when we're excited? It's the same thing, right? Heart beats faster, sweaty palms, adrenaline in the blood system. The only difference between fear and excitement is the story that we tell ourselves. Because now we're not super scared because we're about to stand up and give a talk. It's because we're on a roller coaster or maybe we're going to kiss somebody for the first time. So then what you suddenly figure out is you can switch this voice that has that speaks to you before you give a talk and says, oh my God, your mouth's going to go dry. You're going to forget what you're going to say. It's better not to do this. Why are you doing this? You're putting yourself at risk. And you can switch it to a, an angel voice instead, instead of a demon voice. And this voice, you say to yourself, hey, it's pretty cool I get to do this. Maybe I get to help somebody. Maybe I get to change how somebody does something. Maybe I get to help a teammate in this meeting. Maybe I, I help the project or add value. So use that kind of narrative. Now, it's not something that happens overnight. You know, the first time I did this, I was like, mm, not working as much as I thought it might. But I persevered and I kept going. And what I found over time is that I can now train my brain. Every time I feel it going towards the demon voice, I switch it to the, to the positive narrative about here's the impact that I'm going to have. So combine that with finding your motto because you need something that will remind you. You know, mine is always, Spencer, you know it's always harder to do this than to, to think about doing this than to actually do it. So find what's your motto, what's your self-affirmation that will help you do that. Okay, so what's next? Let's have a look at planning and preparation. So we need to arrive at a point that we say, I'm prepared as I can be, because that is gonna help you with your confidence as well. And it's the same when we, you know, drill down to, I need to speak up in a meeting and say something. And I love this quote by Mark Twain that says, it usually takes me more than three weeks to prepare an impromptu speech because it's so true. Don't let the, the, the time that you plan what you're gonna say in that meeting be in the opening minutes of that meeting or on the walk to the meeting or as you're getting your cup of coffee before you log on to your video conference. Be purposeful and plan it in advance. Because if you look at any high performance athlete, you know, Usain Bolt didn't just rock up one day and he was the fastest person on the planet. There was countless, countless hours of preparation and practice. And by the way, he also had a motto for a better future. This is his self-affirmation that helped quieten that inner demon voice. When nobody knew who he was and he was putting all those hours in, he kept saying, this is gonna help me have a better life, a better future. Now, it's exactly the same if you're a professional speaker or any speaker or just speaking up in a meeting. You know, when we looked at Steve Jobs, we just enjoyed this amazing keynote that he did at Macworld. We didn't see the four months of preparation that went into that in terms of the words that he would say. The four months of preparation that was about where, where is the lighting going to be on the stage. The four months of planning that exact moment to take the iPhone out of his pocket for maximum effect. So preparation is really, really critical. So how can we do it when we want to speak up in meetings? So if we look at planning, you can start by asking, a range of questions. 
Who's going to be in the room? Why have I been invited? What's your objective? What are we there to discuss? So start to frame how you might enter to that conversation. And then you can use something called the Think Do Matrix. And this was created by a guy called Andrew Abella. And it's really powerful. You can use it to plan what you're going to say in a meeting. You can use it to plan what content you're going to put in your presentation. It's really, really effective. And what you do is you fill in the four boxes. What does my audience think now about this topic? And what do I want them to think after I've spoken? What's the change that I want to happen? And the same for do. What's the action somebody's taking or the action that somebody isn't taking at the moment, like giving you budget? Uh, and what's the action that I want them to take afterwards? And what's the change that I need to make happen? Now, because of my obsession with storytelling and emotional connection, I added an extra row in the bottom there, which is feel. How does somebody feel about this topic and what do I want them to feel after I've spoken? Because those three things will help somebody make a decision in your favor. Because when you tell a story about how somebody might feel about something, it will help them connect to it on an emotional level. And the think do sections are all about helping the rational side of the brain think, this is a good idea, I can trust it, let's move forward. So emotion plus trust is the, is the components of getting somebody to agree to what you're saying. Okay, so what else can we do? What about preparation? Well, preparation is starts with things like tech, especially in the last few months. You know, it sounds simple, but so many people don't do it. Make sure five or 10 minutes before you're gonna join a meeting, before you're gonna give a talk, is check everything is working. The Wi-Fi, the camera, the microphone. Make sure the lighting is good. Make sure you've got everything in place. Make sure the background is tidy. All of these things make a big difference and make you feel more confident because it's not going to stress you if when you suddenly join that call that it, it something's not working and you have to solve it. So eliminate the problems that you can. Also think about what are you going to do if something goes wrong? Because things will go wrong. They go wrong for all of us. And what most people do if suddenly they forget what they want to say or it comes out wrong or they get confused is we just keep talking because we don't like leaving a silence. But actually a pause can be pretty powerful. It can create tension and dr drama. So what you can do if you plan your presentation or your, what you're gonna say in advance, you can have your sentence or your paragraph that is your main point the summary of what you're trying to say. And then if you suddenly lose your way, you can pause, say your leading summary, what you want to see, and then you can almost like invisibly pass the microphone to somebody else or the whole room. You can say, say your sentence and then you say, Steve, I'd love to know what you think about this, or I'd love to know what the rest of you think about this. And then that naturally leads to somebody else entering the conversation. So think about what you're going to do if things go wrong. Now, also look at your words because words matter. And this also helps not only other people see you as confident, but help you feel more confident. So, you know, we're all guilty, myself included, of saying things like, you know, I've got this silly idea. Maybe can you help me? You know, we have this almost like non-assuming uh, language that, because we don't want to seem too assertive, we don't want to seem too aggressive, but at the same time, when we err on the other side, then it doesn't project confidence. Whereas you can use volume and tone to not let yourself get too assertive or too aggressive and say, I think it's absolutely right, we should definitely do this, or I completely agree. Use more definite and confident language. So, Finally, a little bit of word on interruptions, because if you've put all that work in place and planned and practiced and, and then somebody interrupts you when you start talking, you need to kind of claim that back. And if you're quick, you can say, hey, Simon, I really want to hear what you have to say on this matter. I'm sure it's going to be valuable, but can I just finish this thought, please? Because it's important that I, I get to the end. And normally that's enough for them to let you complete what you wanted to say. Now, if you're the most senior person in the room, then that's your job to do this as well. 
to actually step in and say, we want, really want to hear what you want to say, but let's let that other person finish. So think about if things get interrupted. Now, finally, let's have a look at practice because practice is also the boring thing that nobody wants to hear, but actually very powerful. So this is a talk I gave about a year and a half after the one that you saw from 2015. And I'd already learned the power of investing a lot of time in practice because the first question I got when I came off the stage by somebody was, how do you look so confident up there on the stage? And the first thing I said was, well, I wasn't. I'm just better at hiding it now. I've still got those feelings in me of, of being nervous that, you know, I can, I, can, I can tell you that six years down the road, it still doesn't go away. You still have it. You just get better at managing it. Now, what I also discovered is what I said to that person was like, you didn't see me the day before. This is a 15 minute talk. And when I arrived to Berlin, this event was in, you know, I didn't go sightseeing for the day. I didn't do my normal work for the day. I spent eight hours practicing that talk again and again and again and again to the point where I couldn't hear the words, but then I had it in my head. And then on the day, I wasn't so scared of losing my way. I, you know, I could look at the room. I could see who's engaged, who's not engaged. I can read the room a little bit better. So practicing is really, really important. And now I tend to think about uh, not just for practicing the talk, but also for design and planning and everything else that you need to be spending one hour for every minute that you're talking. So if you're talking for 15 minutes, you want to be spending 15 hours on all three planning, design and practice. So practice, practice like we're a performance athlete, a performance presenter, you know, think like Usain Bolt and Steve Jobs. So finally, a little bit on equipment and tech, because this can also help build our confidence. So do yourself a favor and figure out how to get the lighting and sound right. Lighting especially can literally take 10 years off how you look on the camera because, you know, we all are spending huge amounts of time like this at the moment, looking at ourselves on the screen, which is really tough. And we all have those days where we feel like, oh my God, I look rough today. But invest a little bit of money in lighting and it can make you feel a lot better about how you look on the screen. You can also invest in an external camera, which instantly makes things everything look a lot better. And of course, a lot of the platforms these days have this lovely thing which is called Touch Up My Appearance. Again, use all of these types of things because all the little pieces of confidence add up to actually quite a lot. So that's it. I hope you found it useful. Remember, positive self-talk is really, really powerful. Change the narrative from fear to excitement to get rid of that inner demon voice and have a motto to remind you to do that positive narrative and don't focus on comparing yourself to others or what people might think about you. Be prepared, you know, plan time in advance, use the think do matrix, ask questions, do the practice hours and hours and hours at least 10 times practice what you're going to say and then it will be a lot better and you'll feel a lot more confident and finally obviously invest in a good either a, a good light lighting to make you look better or sit in front of a window if you can and think about things like cameras so that's it you're ready you are confident and you can go be your best in your next meeting Bye for now. Thank you very much for sharing this with us, Spencer. I think that in times like this, we all need a little bit more assurance and self-confidence. Uh, but let me go into a personal perspective. Uh, I also do a lot of talks and I completely comprehend uh, what you were sharing about being nervous on stage and not showing it. But I have to admit that I do get stage fright before I go on stage and it's terrible. And my trick is to have a pre-recorded playlist that of my favorite music that calms me down and take 15 minutes before I go on stage and just get into my zone. So do you have a ritual or a trick 
uh, that you can share that helps you get over these spikes of anxiety as you're preparing for your talks? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head there that everybody finds their own thing that helps them in those moments beforehand. Um, and I think for me, it's almost like this funnel that gets narrower and narrower and narrower until I get to the talk. And, you know, it starts the day before with making sure that, you know, like we said in the talk, lots and lots of practice, because when I know that I spent six hours the day before practicing, it just gives me that feeling of like, when I, when I have that spike of anxiety, I can go, no, Spencer, you know, this, you've practiced it. Um, and what I found, cause something that happens a lot with me is my mind sometimes will go completely blank, like three minutes before I got on the stage and that can really send you over the edge but that's when I come back to myself and I say no you've practiced this you know it when you get up there you'll be fine and it and that's normally the case um so there's a lot of that kind of uh, positive self-talk which again connects to what we spoke about in the talk um but I think like the other thing for me is like in that quarter of an hour beforehand you know, I actually really enjoy finding people who are going to be sat in the audience and just start chatting to people because mm -hmm. A, I find that distracts me. Um, but also I get a chance to seed questions because, you know, as you'll know, Gilly, like if, once the first person's asked the question, people think, oh, it's okay. I can ask any question. So what I normally do is I find somebody in the audience and I give them like the most simple question to ask. Uh, and that makes them happy mm -hmm. because their confidence put their hand up and ask the question and it gives me a familiar face in the audience so it's not loads of people that I don't know so I tend to find those little things really help me a lot but uh, but practice and positive self-talk they're the two big ones. So what do we do when we're now preparing for all these events and delivery of content on our own because since COVID we are really truly in this together in terms that we have to communicate via digital platforms. Um, so my first question to you, what specific shifts are you seeing happening uh, through this digital media delivery and meetings? And I have like a, a few areas that I want to question you about in terms of digital delivery. So yeah. let's, um, let's begin with the first one, which is online productivity and Zoom fatigue. So yeah. do you have any tips and tricks that you can propose to overcome it? Because the struggle is real. For sure, the struggle is real. Um, I, I think the big one is adopting async communications, uh, which is actually a really big shift for people. And I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking specifically with a filter now about more internal communications and meetings and things like that, as opposed to, you know, like a big conference talk. But what I see is, you know, we all copy pasted what we were doing in the office and we took it into this virtual environment this year in 2020. And it was a bit clunky, but it kind of worked. Uh, and we just shoehorned it into our daily schedule and everybody's daily schedule is different, let's face it. Um, and I think what people are finding now is exactly like you said, Zoom fatigue kicks in. Like this is not really working in the way that we need it to. And what I'm definitely seeing is something that we're doing at Prezi a lot is really asking each time we have a meeting is like, what is this meeting really for? Because if it's only one person talking or we take it in turns to talk, i.e. like a status update meeting, then that doesn't need to be a meeting. That can be a short async video that somebody can watch in their own time, multiple times so they can digest the message and that starts to help to take some of the meetings out. So a lot of it is really trying to figure out, okay, how can we take more meetings out of the, ca of the calendar? Now, a close kind of partner to this is what's called time boxing or what I call like partitioning your day. Um, mm -hmm. Because the other big change is you need to build your day in a way that A, works for your schedule. Now we're all working from home. Um, and you need separate time for async, you need separate time for deep work, um, and you need time for meetings. And what that starts to help you is then if you get, for example, like a video that's something you need before you go into a meeting, you can watch that in your async communication time. And it doesn't interrupt your deep work. And what I see a lot, if you take 
two people inside an organization, you've got somebody who's like a senior manager. Now her calendar is jam packed full of lots and lots of meetings. And if you take an engineer, her time doesn't have a lot of uh, meetings because that's more about writing the code. It's about making sure that things are built. And what normally happens is the senior manager will go, oh, look, I've got that three o'clock slot open and I'm going to call a meeting and the engineer might have to go to that. But for her, it's like that's going to wreck my afternoon of deep work because it's going to pull me out of it. I'm going to have to get back into it afterwards. So I think it's, you know, understanding that everybody's time is used differently um, and to kind of partition your day. And that in combination with asking that question about what is this meeting for anyway uh, and trying to reduce some of them is probably the two most powerful things that we can do. But it's a big move and it takes time because it's hard to shift culture and behavior and things like that. Alors, nous sommes de retour encore une fois sur le plateau d'MTL Connect. Rebonjour à tous. Welcome back to the main stage of MTL Connect. What a lovely conference uh, by one of our speakers, Spencer Waldron from Prezi, and great follow-up questions by our moderator, Galit. They were exchanging so many interesting tactics. Just getting up here, for me, for example, as your host, en tant que votre animateur, écoutez la dernière présentation de Spencer, tellement de positivité et de mots d'encouragement, surtout dans le monde vers lequel on se dirige, où on va, on va être obligé, chacun et chacune de nous, d'acquérir ces, ces nouveaux talents-là pour être plus confortable derrière la caméra. J'ai adoré son input. J'ai vraiment, I found it to be riveting. Again, motivational, inspirational. Of course, I'm biased. I'm a big fan of Prezi. So Spencer, if you hear this, Maybe you could hook a brother up with a left arm pass, you know, Prezi ambassador. Jokes aside, I thought that you were amazing. Again, inspirational speeches to get everyone comfortable behind the, you know, the, the, the screen or behind the camera lens. Um, so great job. Alors, merci encore une fois à notre dernier conférencier, Spencer Waldron, également à Galit Ariel, qui a fait une très belle job à poser de belles questions en tant que modérateur pour le panel. Alors, on continue. Nous, we have other interesting elements of programming that are coming up. On stage two, a little later, um, how will digital health tools such as digital therapeutics find value in our healthcare system? Which could be a very, very interesting topic. Et aussi, un autre topic intéressant pour continuer un peu sur la même veine que uh, Spencer sur le, la présentation et justement l'ère numérique vers laquelle on est en train de faire un pivot assez logique, c'est quelles compétences sont nécessaires um, pour le monde numérique de demain? Donc ça aussi, ça va être sur le stage 1, c'est déjà commencé, mais sur le main stage, sans plus tarder, j'aimerais euh, passer la parole à Ursula Eicher, euh, professeur à la Université de Concordia, et son topic sera be « Next Generation Cities Now ». Donc, je vais passer à eux, MTL Connect, j'espère que vous enjoyez la prochaine conférence.